because the one who called us saved us. And he has his love towards every one of his saints. Let's just stand this morning. Let's remember my uh, stepfather. He's still having problems, so unless the Lord intervenes, uh, there's only so much time. Any other requests here this morning? Unspoken, yes. Too unspoken. I'm thankful that the Lord knows our thoughts. And the scripture says only he knows the thought, not even the angels, not Satan, nobody. God only, praise the Lord. Let's look to him this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we come before thee. We thank you, Lord, that you've seen this moment in time, Lord. You've seen the request that's gone before thee. Lord, you know whether they're even spoken or unspoken. You know the hearts and the intent of every soul, Lord. Now, our, Lord, we have come here this morning to worship and praise thee, Lord, that you would have your way in this service. For I ask it now in that precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Can we see it this morning? I'm going to ask Brother Mike to come lead us in the song service. three in the red book with the blue book and 203 in the blue book
Oh 
to your heart. Yes. And I was studying this, and I was doing a little Bible study on this verse. And then I had this desire to get this old frame that my mother had given to me way back that said Jeremiah 29, 11, which like, talks about plans and how God has a plan for you. Yes. And I went to go get it in the garage, and when I came back, I didn't really look at it. And when I read it, it said Psalms 37, 4. So it wasn't even the same Bible verse I thought it was. And when I read it, I just felt such a peace Praise that Lord. God really does care with the little things that he you know, desires in my heart. Anybody else have a testimony? Brother Elijah, do you have a song? forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you die and rose again amazing love die for me amazing love I know it's true Amazing love, how can it be 
family. <laughs> There's a new family in this year. No? No. <laughs>
so, so many years ago, brought me into the fold and guided me for 94 years. So I praise him. I love you. Chimes a time Read Down for 
quick testimony. Um, three years ago, I, I lost my job. I had worked with the company for 17 years and it closed. And uh, it took a long time to find another job and it was pretty stressful. And, and uh, things were going well and I was just finished moving over to the warehouse in September and I was really liking my job. And 
Three weeks ago, the regional manager came over and told us that the distribution in the warehouse was closing and that we were losing our jobs again. And it was hard. It was really hard. And uh, I told the Lord, I didn't know if I could do it again. I didn't know if I had the strength. But I got that resume ready and I started applying right away for jobs. I didn't want to be in the same situation. I didn't know how long it was going to take. And uh, I applied at a company that I've applied at multiple times. I've had multiple interviews over the last three years and just can't seem to get my foot in the door, no matter how hard I tried. And I just looked at it like, well, that's God's will. And so I applied again, and they called me for another interview. And uh, I went in on Friday, and I had my interview. And uh, it was very short and sweet, and I thought, okay. But it seemed to go very well. And I got home. And an hour and a half later, they called me and offered me the job. And I was so thankful. It was so fast, and it was so unexpected. And the Lord is so good to me. And I just wanted to praise him for that. song says he's able. Let's just stand and change your position this morning. As we approach thy throne of grace, Lord, we thank you for the songs of Zion and testimony this morning, Lord. And we're ever so thankful that your eyes are upon each and every one of us. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray, Lord, that you would use this vessel of clay as you would see fit. In that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray this morning. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. have your Bibles with you this morning, a little bit of continuing on from what we touched on last week, and if I was to call that subject this morning, it would be sevenfold light here in the end time, and surely we've been blessed in the hour that we live in, not a man's doing, but God knows exactly what we have need of, so praise the Lord. So let's go, turn to Romans chapter 11. We're talking about what the Apostle Paul talked about. He says, I would not have you ignorant, uh, sorry, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now, why does it say blindness in part? The ten northern tribes were not blinded. They were never there when Jesus walked the first time on the earth. But to the two southern tribes that was there, they were blinded because they didn't see Jesus Christ in their hour that they live in. So Paul says it's blindness in part. In other words, the two southern tribes were blinded. Yes, the other ten never got to know what was going on. But nevertheless, Paul saying that blindness in part has happened to Israel 
until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now Paul takes it a little further what, than what Jesus has spoke about. And if we want to turn there in Luke chapter 21. And in Luke the 21st chapter. Jesus was talking about things concerning up to, coming up to number 24. He was speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Things here at the end time. But then he goes on to say concerning the Jews of, that would be uh, living a few years after he'd be off the scene. He says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. That's the 2,000 tribes that was in the land of Israel in 33 AD. But they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They didn't fall in 33, but it came, they fell in 96 or 70 AD when the Roman army came and they were coming into the land to stop the, the Jews from the excitement that they were creating and putting the rebellion back into place. But they ended up in Masada and that's where it's all history from there. So they shall fall by the edge of the sword and led captive into all the nations. So the Jews that didn't, wasn't killed, Titus, the, the if you want to, the way that the Romans dealt with people that came in insurrections, the best way to stop an insurrection, you take the people and you divide them and scatter them different places so they can't all get together and cause another ruckus again. So that's what the Roman, the Romans did in that hour. But now Jesus, he's telling what's going to happen to the Jews. Then he points to the city of Jerusalem way down in the future, to our day. And he says, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In, as we read that, yes, we look at, it is secular history that Israel since the Babylonian Empire never had possession of the city of Jerusalem. They were occupied by a Gentile or a non-Jewish nation. But we know that in 1967, in the Six Day War, which God was involved in, Israel now took that city, Jerusalem. That was in 1967. A lot of things come coincidental around 1967. A lot of things that we can look at this morning. Now on another plane, when Paul talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, he's speaking that would only begin when Jerusalem would be in place. And Jerusalem was only in place in 1967. And in 1967, guess what? That's when God had an apostle on the scene. It was time now to bring in the fullness of the Gentile. Now we read the words, the fullness of the Gentiles. But from where we stand this morning and understand in the scripture, it is the last generation to come in. It's the Prior to 1967, God dealt, not in the early days of the Grace Age, but down through time, there was de religious denominations. And by the time God brings a prophet on the scene in 1963 and preaches about six seals, that started the movement to close the door to the denominational religion. Because God was going to be was tired of dealing with the denominational church. He was going to close that door. And when you close that door, it's not done overnight. From, day, from the 14th to the 15th is over a little space of time this happens. And so from Brother Brano's message was the means of that door being closed to the religious world. And by the time you reach 1967, 
You bring in what Paul is saying about the fullness of the Gentile. The last generation is what it is. Because when we look at 1967, we know from what God has revealed in just a few years ago that Luke refers to two watches. He refers to a second watch and a third watch. And you say, well, where's the first one? It's in Matthew chapter 25. That was in the days of Brother Branham, that watch. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 25. So now the second watch and the third watch goes hand in hand with the last generation. It is the generation where God now is pulling individuals out of every denomination and bringing them in. And in order to bring them in, it's not just to bring them in to the gospel of the apostles, but to bring them in to complete his plan and his, the revelation of his word, of a lot of things that was needful that would only, only the bride could receive. Because she was the one that would be hungry for knowing the Father's plan. And not you'd be religious and saying, I'm saved, thank the Lord, hallelujah, I'm saved, and on my way to glory. The bride wants more than that. She wants to know, Lord, what are you doing? What do you have? What's your plan? And so, from 1967, it started with an apostolic ministry. You'll find that in Luke chapter 12, verse 36 and 37 and 38. Because it talks about that the Lord shall descend, shall come and serve me to servants, plural, not one, um, a number of them. It didn't say how many. And I believe, John, when the Lord done that, as the message would start bringing in people from outside of the world, it would draw true believers and tares. There would be servants. Because in 1967, the tares weren't all gone. The denominational tares, the religious tares, they are being bundled. But the individual terror still was still in the church. So now as we are moving into that period of time, it took some 40 years for God to not only lay the basic doctrines of the apostle. By that time, by the time that apostle is finished in 2005, the gospel of the apostle, the uh, doctrine of the apostle, we've had it for, they've had it for 54 years. But now... God was bringing in new things to get ready for watching. Because when Luke talks about that he's feeding servants, it's for a purpose. What is he feeding the servants for? Because he wants to raise a ministry. Because his word says in Ephesians that it would be a five-fold ministry that would bring the bride to perfection or completion. It would not be one apostle. It would not be a prophet. Those messages are necessary to lay a groundwork for a fivefold ministry. And the fivefold ministry is under the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When it says the fivefold ministry, it says ministry singular, but it's divided into five offices that God would now start dealing. And that fivefold ministry started getting on the ground here in 2005. And now don't look at 2005, they were, they were, they knew everything. <laughs> they were starting out too, so that would take a process of time. And as we would go through time, and Jesus says, what about if I come in the second watch? Or a third watch? He's not talking about watching the doctrine of the apostles. He's talking about watching the hour that you're living in. Because it says, if you don't, the following verses, he compares it like to a man that had his house broken because he had not been watching the Lord when he would be coming. Now, as we are here in this period of time here, the bride will reach sevenfold light. Now, where do you get that? Well, I could have put that up, I suppose. If we go to Isaiah chapter 30 and 25.
Isaiah, the Lord gave Isaiah a prophecy concerning the end time. And he said that there shall be on every high mountain and upon every high hill and rivers a stream of water in the day of the great slaughter. So upon the mountains there would be rivers and streams of water. It's not a physical mountain. Because what God has given to Isaiah in, in, in chapter 30, verse 25, is a metaphor or an example of what God was going to portray down the end. And the water and the streams on the high hill, God has the highest mountain. He compares his domain as a high mountain. There's kingdoms of the world. They are considered as mountain as well or, or denominations or, or, or beast systems. But this here mountain would have waters and stream flowing into it. And what is the stream and the water, if we were using this as a metaphor or a parable, is none other but the word of God coming down on a people here at the end time. Now the thing is, when... Now remember, Isaiah, in that hour he said that, there's a lot of things that was not known. You're way back there in 600 B.C., somewhere in that area. And so as... The Lord is delivering this to him. He says, and when the towers shall fall. And I can see, I remember some of the religious denominations. Oh, the towers fall. That's 9-11. My foot that has nothing to do with that at all whatsoever. Yes, you can use that as the words of the same. Twin towers fell. But that's not the coincidence that we're looking at here this morning. When the towers fall... Is the towers of the whole world system. That's when the Lord will come in his physical second coming. And at that hour, when, the physical, when he comes in his physical second coming, prior to it, there would be waters on the mountains of God of being fed with truth. It doesn't give you details in any shape or form, but it leading up to the hour where his physical coming would come, there would be waters to drink if you're in the right place where God has got the bride to watch and wait. Now, here's, he's saying here, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. If I was just reading that as if I not had read the Bible before, well, I know where the moon is, and I know where the sun is. But remember, this is to portray something. And if we were just read it with our own intelligence, you can get all kinds of ideas. But the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. In 96 AD, John was given a prophecy in Revelation chapter 12 concerning the woman Israel having the moon under her feet and the sun in her disposition. So he's pointing to Israel would have light at the end time. She don't have that light now. She will have it in the week of Daniel when the two prophets are on the scene in that first half of the week. But then he goes on to say, The light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days. Oh, how that got twisted and never had opinions and things on what does that all mean? Some look at it as sunlight. Oh, in the eternal age, it's going to be seven times brighter. It's a wonderful thought. was physically impossible in the eternal age. Because you'll have immortal subjects living there, like Adam was before, before the fall, that would be subject to heat, cold, and so forth. And if it was sevenfold physical light, brothers and sisters, the 
you and I would have to be where Mercury is. Mercury has seven times more light physical in the, in the natural, more light than the Earth has. And having sevenfold more physical light, I'd like to see a millennium subject or eternal subject living on Mercury because it's 450 degrees centigrade there. Mercury's orbit is only 88 days. That's not a perfect 360 days. So just to look at it from what we were talking in, in Isaiah, you can't throw that in the physical realm. It has nothing to do with the physical realm. How many understand that? So therefore the earth is still going to be with our sun that we have now. Uh, here. So what is this sevenfold light? In the day that the Lord binds up the breach of his people. Binding the breach of his people was not in 33 AD. It was not in 1967. Nor in the 70th week of Daniel. Oh, sorry, there it will be. So God will breach bring that breach of his people that's been wounded is when he has two prophets on the scene speaking to those Jews. So time-wise, it's pointing in the week of Daniel. Now, yes, the bride will be in glory where those two prophets are on the earth in that first half of the week. The bride will be up in glory at this time here. And the healing of the breach is done here in that first half of the week. But the, bri but the, the, the light of one day will be at the light of seven days. What's it referring to? If we looked and we just brought to you this morning how that the light of the moon was as the light of one day, which points to the light of the revelation that Israel would have in the week of Daniel, that's to her. But who is going to have light and then sevenfold light? It's the grace age. And in this grace age, when the early church started, the light they had was the, as the light of one day of revelatory understanding. But when it comes to the end time, when the tower is going to fall, well, when everything is completed, the Lord's looking at it from this point of view here. The bride will have reached sevenfold light at the rapture. Does that mean we have sevenfold more of the Holy Ghost? No. We'll have sevenfold more knowledge of light of the plan of God than they did in the early church. How many can see that? So this here is, and the light of the sun, that's concerning us Gentiles, that the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, and in the day that the Lord binding up the breach of his people and heals them, heals them of their, their stroke of their wound. Now, as we're looking at that, we're looking at light. Uh, maybe I've got it here somewhere. Oh, maybe I didn't put it up there. All right, I'll just uh, quote it. In Psalms 84, verse 11. It says that the Lord God is a S-U-N, not a S-O-N. God is light. But he is also light for, of truth as well. He is both. Because we're going to look at something, just common sense will put it into perspective. Before the universe ever was created, God is in his planning room. Was he fumbling in the dark? 
There's no physical sun there, no stars. God lights up his own world, the spirit world. All right? And so therefore, if he lights up that spirit world, God's intensity don't change. If he's light, he will always be that light of that intensity, whatever he is. Of the truth he is, he'll always be that truth of the truth of the he is. But now as we bring it down to the time, as those of the early church would pass on, they go up to glory. Because nobody could go to heaven before Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So when they go up in glory in the spirit world, there's no physical star or sun that shines in that area. What lights up the spirit world? It's God himself. And when we talk about God, the creator, the all in all, He has no form, no shape that you can take of. He is pure thought. And thought doesn't have, you can't confine that in a form or any definition. So his thought spans from eternity past to eternity future. That's the God that we serve. Now Jesus... When he died, went up to Calvary. He didn't become everywhere present, nowhere absent. That's something impossible. That's not possible for Jesus himself to be. Jesus will never be omnipotent. Omniscience, knowing everything. Omnipresent, everywhere. But he's tapped into the one that is those things. Because he that is those things was in his son. That didn't make Jesus to know every thought and everything that's taking place. Because we'll find scripture where he talks about Jesus himself says, Of that day and that hour, no man knoweth, not only the Father, not not even the Son or the angels. All power... When Jesus was given power, it was power concerning our salvation, not to rule the universe. Omnipresent, being everywhere. Now, I know from the, those of Pentecostal rank, those that maybe have pulled in some of those thoughts that they never let go. Jesus hears every prayer. When you talk like that, that Jesus can hear... The man, Christ Jesus, although he's in a glorified body, although the Father's in him in his fullness in the throne, he's there as high priest. He doesn't travel everywhere. He doesn't hear everything. Because he's, didn't he say when you pray, don't pray to me, pray to my Father that sees in secrets, because he knows everything. And he says only God, in this, I believe the Second Chronicle chapter 6, for around 38, 39, only God sees the secrets of the heart, only That's in the Old Testament. So what Jesus sees as the secret of the heart is what the Father shows him about it. Now, and it probably might have been a nice thought in the days of Pentecost that Jesus hears and knows everything when you're praying. Well, let's put it this way. You might as well say he's like Santa Claus that can deliver presents all over the world in one night, in four hours. Is that possible? You know it's not. It's just man's imagination. But everything that's needful to head up the church, the Father brings it to His Son. Remember, He's the head of the church. Just like the type in the Old Testament, the high priest didn't go to every corner in Israel to, uh, to take sacrifice for the people that were there. There was other priests that, that took places. It's like God being everywhere in in that sense. But the high priest was there to represent the nation. Jesus is there to represent the bride. All right.
So, Jesus has full access to the Father as what the Father relates to Him. To you and I, we have it in a small measure. Doesn't the Holy Ghost speak to you? Huh? Don't we have the one Father the same? Right? So there we go. Praise the Lord. So therefore, by the time we arrive and Jesus breaks that seventh seal, the revelation of his word is pretty well accomplished. Because the only thing we'll know during that silent or that half hour, that seventh seal time factor, the only thing we get to know then there's going to be seven thunders sound, which is just information for the bride to get ready to leave here. So by the time the rapture takes place, if you want to in that sense, the bride will have sevenfold light. And that sevenfold light is revelatory light. And when the bride goes to heaven in the rapture with the Lord Jesus Christ, when we all go up to heaven, through the wedding supper. What lights up the spirit world is God. Because of us having sevenfold light, we don't light the spirit world any brighter because we're not God. But we do have the truth of his plan. So light can be represented as the word of God and the revelation of it, but as far as what lights up the spirit world, it's the spirit of God. All right. Now, as we look at those instances where, by the time we're at the wedding supper, looking backwards, that's where Isaiah chapter 30 is looking at. Everything is accomplished. The Jews came from the moonlight to a one day light. In other words, from types and shadows to the light of Jesus Christ, which the prophets and the two prophets will reveal to them. They're not going to have the message of the bride. They'll have whatever the Lord leads them and understand that they'll know who their Messiah is. But to you and I, looking back from that point of view, the bride has came to sevenfold light. Now, is there, is there something else that can describe... That sevenfold light? Yes, there is. We're going to look at two parables. We don't have to open to it. You must have read it plenty of times. In Matthew chapter 25, it says, A man is going on a far journey, he's starting his journey. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave works to servants that was starting out in that first, and when the grace age started. Then he looks down the end of time, and he, he looks at when, the, not that he's looking at time, but he's looking at their conditions, what their reward is going to be. And to one was given one talent. And when he does come before the judgment seat of Christ, which will be in that seventh seal time factor, that's where that's going to take place, that servant is, is told, you were given one talent and you're going to receive reward for one city. Or you receive one. One for one. The other one had two and he gets two. So the ratio is one to one. And Jesus makes a distinction between what he says in Matthew chapter 25. Here he's using talents, which is points to, if you look at the crust of the whole thing, is revelation. So they're getting, a, if, if they were given one talent for revelation, they'll, they'll, they'll increase by one. If he's got two, he increased two. In other words, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. But when you go to Luke chapter 19... 
the same Jesus is now speaking. And Luke records it this way. It says, when he has, re- has, come de- has received the kingdom, and he's at the end time. Because it's going to start taking place from 1963 onward, because he says he's going to deliver pounds. After, he, after a long time, he's returned. He's coming. He came in a message. The carcass was being delivered, starting to be delivered in 1963. It starts there, but the most part of the carcass is from 67 onward. And so as you look at that parable in Luke chapter 19, he doesn't say talents over here. He's talking about pounds. So that one day down the road where we are now, we could look at these parables. Jesus is talking about how the how the light would be in that first age coming down through till the time of the end time. Because remember, the revelation that the apostles had, they received from Jesus, and then when they went into the ministry, God gave them some revelation as well. But by 96 AD, that was it. And no more new revelation till you reach 1963. So these two parables are predominantly looking at both ends of the grace age. So here he is at the, at the end time, the same thing as, as in Thessalonians, the Lord shall descend with a shout, 1963 onward. Luke chapter 12 says the Lord comes and he delivers pounds to servants. And to know when he's talking about, and that just comes to mind as well. He didn't say I delivered to the 12 He makes a distinction to know that you're speaking about the end time. Maybe I can put a chart there too uh, on that. Here's the one fold. But here at the end time in Luke chapter 12. He says he delivered them to. Now he says ten servants. Is it only going to be ten ten men? No. Remember, these are parable. It's not something you can go say, Thus saith the Lord, this is happening exactly like it is there. He's using that as a parable. So he said there was using ten servants, which at the end time, we got to understand what Matthew chapter 25 speaks about, that there would be five wise and five foolish. So Luke chapter 19, verse 12 and 13, it's pointing to you and I from 1963 when it's talking about delivering revelation. So now he's delivering. He's here at the end time because that's where the the parable of Luke 19 speaks about. The parable of Luke chapter 12, he talks about the three watches. We're living in this, it would be in the second and third watch, in the time that the fullness of the Gentile come in. It's the last generation. Well, praise the Lord. And as he brings in, it talks about other things, which I don't want to deviate in the, in the message now to go into other areas. But when you arrive to the 15th verse of that 19th chapter, He says, when he was actually come, having received the kingdom. When did he receive the kingdom? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, it says, glory and honor and power is given unto him. And so that's when he's receiving the authority for the kingdom. So now he's down here. Not physically, but an angel is there to represent Jesus Christ here on the earth. That would be in this time here. He says, while he's here on earth, he uses a small little word, then. What does it mean at that time? That's what it means, then. He says, bring these servants to me. And as he's bringing these servants... This is happening on the earth. That's why he's going to be 
we're looking at really who's the quick and the dead. Because Jesus, the physical Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified Jesus Christ, is going to be judging the, the saints, the deceased saints in glory, while the angel on his behalf is now on the earth judging the living element. So when he was here on earth, he said, bring me then, at that time, bring me these servants so I can give them their, see what they made with their reward. So the first one comes and he says, Lord, my pound has brought ten pounds. It's no longer one to one now. The second one says, hey, my two brought five. And when you look at those two together, if you average them, it's a seven to one ratio. So here at the end time, I might as well go back here. Here at the end time, in this time here, when he is bringing now at the end saying they're going to be a 7 to 1 ratio, because remember that Luke chapter 19 is not from the beginning in 33. It's not in the dark ages. It's not when the prophet first started. But it's here at the end time in this last period of time or this last generation or that fullness of the Gentile in that period of time when it has run its course then he actually, the Lord Jesus is dealing with the deceased saints in glory that's why the angel down here on his behalf he has the, all the characteristics of Christ has given to him to do this and also the spirit of almighty God because that rainbow he comes with that's not Jesus that's your heavenly father showing investment in this angel giving him the authority to do this on their behalf so as he's dealing with the, those down here, that's not too far up the road from us. And so therefore, breaking that seventh seal, that's all the Brandon movement are looking for. They're tipsy-turvy, depending where they are, whether the seven thunders are going to be seven men or it's going to be Brother Branham. It ain't going to be Brother Branham. It's going to be seven men. It says their voices, not his voice, brings those seven thunders. So now as we are in that time factor, that angel that comes, he has one foot on the earth and one foot on the land at the same time. The land and, and then sea. Showing a universal point of view. He will be doing not... Because why... Because when we're looking at those thunders, when the seal is broken, let's say we're right here, when the seal breaks, the angel of Revelation chapter 10 comes. He shouts his voice. And then the seven thunders has to sh sound their voices. It's not because they're all going to get up on one Sunday and everybody's on the Internet and everybody hears everything within two hours. Those voices has to sound in the bride and takes time for it to be applied, which for probably seven months, maybe a year, a year and a half, depending on, we don't know the time frame, but it's not in a few hours or a week. So as that's being applied, now put yourself, when that seventh seal, Jesus breaks the seal, what's he doing in heaven? Why does... Lord, you don't want to travel? Why are you sending an angel? Why don't you come yourself? And we're not talking about, you know, well, I'll be there in 10 minutes. No. This seventh seal time factor actually is going to probably be around three to three and a half years. About. And like we dealt last week, how do you know it's going to be about that time? I don't know the exact years or the amount in the sense I know it's not going to be two and it's not going to be five because where I get this from is Ezekiel chapter 39 where it talks about it'll take seven years to bury, to, sorry, to burn the weapons. You can't burn the weapons while you're at war. So it has to be some sort of peace time to go through. 
and the time that Israel will no longer be at peace is when the Antichrist goes against those Jews and kills two-thirds of them, according to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. From there, you're in the last half of the week. Then the Antichrist, and then are they getting ready for Armageddon? So there's no peace time for them to clean the weapons in the last half of that week. So therefore, it eliminates the last half of the week. Then if you take from the middle of the week, backwards to the beginning of the week, it's what? How many years? Three. And that leaves you what? To what? To Ezekiel, right? Now the minute that war ends, when is that seven seal broke? It's somewhere in around that time. We won't know the day or the hour when that's going to take place. So that's why I'm saying it's about three and a half years. And if those that say, well, no, nobody knows or you can't understand this, what Bible are you reading? What don't you understand about Ezekiel 38 and 39? That it would take seven years to burn the weapons. From that time there, if you, when do you believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to be? Unless you believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 so there are going to be seven years before even the seven seals broke. Then you're in a wrong time factor in what the things that God has brought in this hour. The apostle that you believe in said that the seventh seal would be broke when Ezekiel, around Ezekiel 38, 39, when it ends somewhere in that vicinity. So therefore, it's not pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It's scriptural. So therefore, now we're at this point here. But then, when this is all done, and all the prayers are being offered up. All these things, these nuggets that we've had here, what did God show? In the days of Brother Jackson, they didn't deal too much with Luke chapter 36, 37. Occupied till we come. That came from 2005. The archangel was a that was revealed that the archangel characterizes Christ but it was a great big battle in in 2005 2006 the prophet and brother Jackson didn't deal with the earth reeling to and fro and the stars falling and the ring of fire when does that happen he says in the day of the Lord the earth is going to reel to and fro and the stars of heaven is going to fall our sun, you can fit all the planets in the sun. And the stars of heaven are, our sun is a small star compared to those stars that are in heaven. And if they fell on the earth, forget the millennium, forget the eternal age, forget the rest of the Bible. The earth be finished, boom, complete. So therefore the reeling, the stars falling, it, it goes along with another revelation that it talks about in Isaiah 24 where the earth is going to reel to and fro. The earth is going to reel to and fro. And if you're on the earth looking at the stars at night because it will reel to and fro, it'll be, it'll, the sun will go down in half the day. If you're looking at the, top, the, scar, the stars at night, now, if you look at the stars at night, because the earth is not reeling to and fro, they're so slow in moving. But if you move like this, then those stars will have like a tail, and it looks like they're falling towards the earth. It has the appearance of falling. So what does all that all have to do? It's just more information concerning the day of the Lord. And we, we can go into that subject as well, but not this morning. God said he sits on the circle of the earth, the expanding universe. I know there was spoke about that God fills the universe and the universe is in him. Well, that's wonderful. But in the last 10 years... 
with modern discovery, with the technology they have, with the things even Einstein talked about, that this now, this, this man that died in, in, in uh, England, Stephen Hawkins, Hawkins? Hawkins, yes. He confirmed what Einstein had said. Not that he, in theory, but not only in theory, now with the modern technology, they see that the universe is actually expanding. Now, wasn't that due to your God? If the earth is in him, does he get fatter as it grows? Huh? And Einstein, now I'm not lifting the man Einstein, but just the thought is so simple. And though knowing that the universe expands, is there scripture in the Bible? Yes, there is. God said he spreads them out like a curtain. The universe he's spreading out, not the earth. So it is ever expanding. So the only in those last 10 years is confirm what his word says. And it has been ever expanding. If you take and look at, well, the universe is in God and the God is in the universe. Actually, what we are saying by that, the natural world is in God. God lives in the spirit realm. There's no dimension to him. So it doesn't matter if the earth grows and so forth. Getting back to Einstein, he says, if the universe keeps expanding all the time, and it's not expanding at five miles an hour, at the speed of light, it's growing apart. That's fast. He says, if the universe keeps expanding, then when you look at it at time, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Then it just took a simple thought. Well, if it gets bigger and bigger with time, if I go back in time, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, till you, where would you end up with a big bang? How simple. So there we go. Now, The seven women to one man, that was revealed in, since 2005. The doors, plural. Brother Jackson, Brother Brown, not, never touched about the doors, plural. They said it was at the door, but they mentioned it, but they never got into it. The two days of Hosea is the same as the church ages. Joel, the latter rain and the former rain in the first month. How was that in the first month? Where? In the days of Adam, Moses, Jeremiah, in the days of Jesus? No, it's the first month of the week of Daniel that he will give the former and the latter rain, which is the ministry of those two prophets. That's where that belongs. That came since 2005. Sevenfold light that we're talking about now. That was in 2012. The branch of the Lord in Isaiah 4 and 2 is a small branch, meaning the nation of Israel, not the Lord Jesus Christ. The great army of Ezekiel 37 and 10, that's that army that's coming up in that miracle war. It all fits in there without going through all these things. Anyway, this, all these things are not big things, but God has allowed these things, nuggets that fits into the picture and that's why the bride has going to have sevenfold more light before she leaves here at the end time. Now, when we move from that time frame there and we go now into the eternal age, because there too, some were talking about, well, the Bible says there's going to be no, no night there, no day, or, or so forth. How do you reconcile all this talk, this about? Well, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, he says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun nor the moon. 
And man thinks, oh, the city, yeah, like Moncton, uh, New York, uh, uh, Jerusalem. It's not that city. We are that new Jerusalem in the spirit realm. We won't need the natural light of a sun or of a moon if we, because we'll be able to live in the spirit world as well into the natural world in that eternal age. Because look, it says, to shine it, for the glory of the Lord lightens it. Didn't I tell you God lights up the spirit world? Huh? And the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, the light thereof, that's the truth of it. All right? You'll find other scriptures in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 19 to verse 20. talks about how in that day concerning the light that we just spoke about here, it confirms uh, Revelation chapter 21. In Genesis 8.22, it talks about as long as the earth exists, there will always be four seasons. Why does there have to be four seasons? Oh, wow. We could go on here for a whole lot more here. Things that, just to put it brief. If the earth did not have a tilt, there would be no four seasons. It would get so hot, you'd fry. Or you'd be up there, be so cold, you'd freeze to death. Because how many have houses, and when it's cold, you have to put the heater on, right? And so the heat from outside counterbalances the cold that's outside, right? So you can live. While the heat here rises, and when it rises, the cold is up there. So both goes, and they mix, and makes a uniform average temperature for the planet, because now she's in a tilt. And she will have four seasons, and that's why there has to be a tilt, and that's why the earth has to spin. That's, we could take a whole sermon just on, on, but that would only be in natural science, if you want to. But just as a brief description. So that's what talks about that even in the eternal age, there will be four seasons. And how when we look at sometimes in our mind in the days, I'm sure, in Pentecost, there was no way for them to know, and they're not at blame that way. Or You can only speak in the revelation or the, the thing that's on ground that you know at the time. So in that hour, they said, when Adam was put into the Garden of Eden, the planet was perfect. It was sunshine all over the planet, North Pole, South Pole, and all over the place. No, it was not. Because way back, I forget in what year, oh, in 2003, they dug down in the ice core, and the core, they can relate it how old it is, and there was some ice when they went three miles deep, was 750,000 years old. Abner's only been here 6,000 since Adam. So there was ice even back then. All right. In the Garden of Eden, what made it perfect was the presence of God in that geographical spot. What made it perfect, now remember, God, when he uses a terminology to measure time or condition, he don't change. The sun rules the day. Well, they say, well, well we, we have, since the days of Adam, it's it slowed down a few seconds. Day means a cycle. When the day starts, it comes, it's a circle, goes back to its origin. That's God's definition. He doesn't say it's 24 hours. Now, if you believe it, living on Venus, that it's not 24 hours. Or, or, or Mars, it's very short. So, that throws that out the window. And so God also, when he made the earth, he made it perfect to be inhabited. 
And when he made it perfect to be inhabited, that over the process of time, he, w- he was getting the earth to be upgraded to the time that he knew that he would be putting man on there. And when he put man in, in a, God's definition in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, the earth went around the, the, the sun in a 360-day orbit. And when we look at God's measurement, when you see that through the scripture, it's always 360 days. What caused it? What caused the deep freeze? All God had to do is allow the planet, let's say this is the sun, allow the planet go a little bit of ways, and she goes into a deep freeze. And when he starts, breaks up in Genesis 1, verse 1, God made the heavens and the earth 13.8 billion years ago when he started it. But in verse 2 and onwards, God is just describing the effects as he's bringing the earth gently closer to a 360-day orbit. Ice melts, vapor, water, then, then no more vapor. They see the stars and so forth. All those six creative days, he could have told Moses, Moses, I'm going to move the planet, and this is what the cause and effects are going to take place in 6,000 years, in 6, years before I put man on there. But he told it in such a way that they would understand. They had no understanding of, of the planets moving anything else. I mean, when you go back in the days, even the Catholic Church, that the earth was flat and the, and the sun revolved around the earth and all that kind of stuff. When it was plain in, this, in the Bible, had they read that little scripture that it says God sits on the circle of the earth. The earth was a circle, not a flat plate. How wonderful. <laughs> but it was there all the time. But it had, things had to come on ground with instruments and so forth that man could see it. Just like Galileo. And they almost put him to death, but they put him in a, in a solitary confinement jail area because he said the earth is not flat. And the, earth, the sun doesn't go around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. That must have caused a whole lot. But it was so simple for him to see things. Let's say this is part of the earth. You're in the ocean looking towards me. When a ship would come up, the first thing they would see is a mass. Then as the ship gets closer, they see the ship. Well, that means you have to be going on a circle, on a far arc. Okay. I know I went through a lot of things. But here at the end of time, there would be sevenfold more light of understanding of the plan of God. When is God going to reveal his full plan anyway to his bride? In the millennium? In the eternal age? She's going to get to know that before she leaves here. And because she has sevenfold more light, that ain't going to mean that you as an individual are going to be seven times brighter than the Apostle Paul was. Uh Uh-uh will be the same brightness. You ain't going to have more of the Holy Ghost than what the measure that God's given us. But it's the revelation of His truth that is that light. And when we're talking about light in that eternal age, I'm glad that the sun's still going to be in the same place. That you won't have to wear sunglasses if it's sometimes brighter. Now, I've got to get my eye done. And they said, I've got to put uh, you know, some sunglasses and that's and just seeing a little bit more brightness. Can you imagine if it was seven times more bright? You would take a bright sunny day here, and at the end of the day, on a long day in the summer, it's pretty bright. But if it was seven times brighter, it would take your eyeballs out, Phys- physically, uh, me- metaphorically speaking. So, as it may be, At the end time, there would be sevenfold more light. There's a whole lot of scripture we could bring in to, to show scripture upon scripture of the things we're talking about here this morning. It would take a week to cover every aspect. But I'm just looking at it here and enough to give you a breakdown this morning. And I know some of you have heard it and some have not. It's the first time hearing things. But if you're patient... And if we're looking into God's word together, 
we will get to see the hour that you and I are living in. And like Jesus was saying in Luke chapter 9, 12, he says, watch and pray. Because why? There would be more things that God would open that would be necessary for the bride before that seventh seal is broke. And we sit here, oh yeah. And then the blue Monday comes along. What about if you live in the days of Martin Luther and all you had to hear, the just shall live by faith. How many, how long would you stay here? Or anywhere? You'd say, after I heard it a thousand times, that's enough. But for them, it was meaningful because their life depended on it. And they cherished it. And you and I should cherish what God is doing for us in this hour. But let's not neglect how we live, too. Because if that doesn't come in line, forget all the knowledge that you may accumulate till it's here through the rapture. But brother, uh, no, that's why the Holy Ghost is given to you. And I'm sure all of you, unless you're a little child, maybe four or five years old, you can't read. They can't read. But you all can read, right? Should you read your Bible? Doesn't it tell you what you, you and I need to do? Of course it does. All right, I'll it's getting worse as age getting on. Let's just stand this time. Lord, we're ever so thankful, Lord, for the nuggets, Lord, that you have allowed us to see in this hour. And Lord, we're still waiting upon thee in its proper time, Lord whatever you would have for us in the days to come till the time, Lord, that seven seal is broke. I thank you, Lord, this morning. Use the words that was spoken as you would see fit. Bless my brothers and sisters, I pray. In Christ Jesus' name I ask, amen. Be seated in case the, someone still has a need. We'll have the musician to come, and then we'll dismiss after that.
He's always there for me. Very carefully, watching over me, night and day. He's always there for me. Let's all stand this time. I'm going to ask Brother Ray to come dismiss with a word of prayer. And I believe some of the sisters has a, got a little something downstairs with their, our brothers and sisters from the Congo. So I right, praise the Lord. So, Brother Ray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your wonderful love and mercy to us. Thank you for your leadership from day to day. Heavenly Father, as we dismiss, go our several ways. We just pray, Father, that you would bless the fellowship that it is to follow. Bless the food to our use. Bless your people everywhere, Lord, that are looking your way this day. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you.